in the Caribbean that are members of CF CFETF that are today and tomorrow closing accounts and taking measures against uh, Guyanese entities and, and Guyanese customers and businesses and, and so on, and economic impacts, most of which are, are um, relatively measurable and quantifiable if the information is available. The third is not as measurable or quantifiable, and that is lost business or other opportunities. And then the fourth is the cost of future compliance and effectiveness, the cost of achieving future compliance and effectiveness. Now, because what I gave you, the information I gave you today, it looks towards the future, everything that I mentioned today will be applicable to Guyana as we go forward, both in terms of how we address our current situation and how we achieve an effective anti-money laundering regime after we've addressed the current situation. At the moment, we have the tools. No, let me rephrase that. We have the ability to do more, to, to, to do both. What we have to do is demonstrate both the will and the ability to transform that will into action that will deliver an effective um, email safety regime. And just for the sake of our notification as well, if you want to know what an advisory looks like, say from the US, uh, in relation to countries against whom FATF, and I keep stressing FATF as against CFATF, this is FATF, um, countermeasures uh, have been taken. This is an advisory by FinCEN, the US Financial Crimes Net Enforcement Network. I'm not going to go through it, I just wanted to see what it looks like. So you'll be able to leave this presentation having had a visual of many key documents for yourself uh, in terms of what it looks like. No one can, can sort of could wink you about what it looks like. Which brings me to, um, to my conclusion. And I'll try to read because I, I, uh, I want to be careful not to be uh, misquoted again. Now, the challenge that lies ahead requires that we press through the current CFATF and, and forthcoming FATF action. Uh, personally, I'm quietly and cautiously optimistic about what the future holds for Guyana in terms of building its own modern, compliant, perhaps even super compliant and effective ML safety regime. This one is on our shoulders and we must deliver. Regardless of where we are in the world, each of us has a role to play. Now, if you'll permit me to take another selfie, I like to think that wherever in the world I am, I'm always keen to remind myself that I'm Guyanese first. My personal waterfall of life-focused priorities begins with love of God, then love of family, then love of country, then love of community, and finally love of company. Like you, I'm passionate about my country, and although I'm currently resident outside of Guyana, I believe, and perhaps in my conceit, that I'm harnessing a suitably personal suite of knowledge, skills, experiences, and attributes, ultimately to return home while I'm still very young, and to deliver specifically for love of country, generally in service of that waterfall of lifetime priorities. Sometimes we have to stand together and defy the odds as a people. Sometimes the opportunities we have in life to make it better for others, particularly the poorest among us, is missed because we're distracted by egos. Sometimes our sense of being a good human gets lost in the noise of power, money, and often senseless, selfish ambitions. Sometimes we have to take a breath and get the big picture and achieving effectiveness in our AML safety regime. Achieving effectiveness in our AML safety regime is one of those instances. There are many things we can learn from. I give you the example of Malawi. And, and we should never be too proud to do that. I'm reminded of the saying that says, I have the blues because I have no shoes, but up the street, I met a man without feet. So if you think we have it bad, there's someone else that, have it, that, that has it worse. I believe that there's something that should gain our collective unwavering support, and of course, ML safety is one of those things. Now, everyone will have a story, and we have to know what will be our story in our bid to overcome our ML safety challenges. The key takeaway tonight is that from today and going forward, the need for effectiveness in national ML safety regimes is no longer just an ideal. Effectiveness just like compliance, is now a critical necessity. It is not a status, it is a process, and achieving effectiveness will take time and is expensive. The bad news for countries with significant strategic deficiencies in the MLCFT framework is that a success of the MLCFT regime will be dominated and determined by how we handle not only technical compliance, but rather both technical compliance and effectiveness. And the simple message today is that our intention to build an safety regime will matter.
but our actions. Remember, I promise you we'll come back to that word right at the end. Our actions will matter more than our intentions. In other words, to achieve effectiveness, intentions matter. But the problem is so profound, so pervasive, that our collective actions matter more. And today, in the aftermath of the passing of Maya Angelou, I, there's a profound quote that she made about intentions and actions that I wish to share with you. And this is what it says. Remember, people will judge you by your actions, not your intentions. You may have a heart of gold, but so does a hard boiled egg. So does this kind of boiled egg and this kind of boiled egg. It was an honor speaking with you this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you and good night. It's coming. It's coming. It's here. Republic Bank's Deal on Wheels is back again. Get a car or bike for less from June 2nd to August 29th with reduced rates and reduced down payment on loans. Plus, win a chance to escape to St. Lucia, Barbados, Trinidad, Cayetua Falls, or Baganara Island Resort. And money to spend with a loan that's easy, quick, and so affordable. Republic Bank will take you places. Republic Bank, we're the one for you. Anybody who wants to ask a question, please stand. Um, state your name and ask, direct your question to uh, Mr. Boyce here at the head table. Um, Dr. Boyce, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I can attest that um, I'm going to be leaving this room a lot more informed and aware than I came in. And I beg to congratulate the GCCI for this remarkable initiative as well. Um, it's also very enlightening to hear um, about the Malawi um, example, and also I'm really excited about you know the fact that, as you said, uh, we have an opportunity here because we've been here for the past uh, two years about uh, you know on negativity and and and, and um, follows from from what uh, what happened, and it also uh, dawned on me as well too in, 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 that really and truly. Having the, the amended legislation passed is just basically the tip of the iceberg. So I just want to say that you know, thank you very much, and I think this is um, is a remarkable opportunity for us. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. Uh, you didn't identify yourself, but thank you for your very flattering comments. I would like to say I stressed a few times during the presentation that we need to get the big picture. And I did so, maybe I was being a bit too diplomatic as well, but I need to sort of walk that line to be careful in articulating something as sensitive as this, because uh, any, any person with an agenda can seek to twist it uh, to their own means. And so I try to be as neutral, but also as informative as possible. And I believe that those of us who know a little bit more about um, not only in LCFT, but in, in the case of tonight, achieving effectiveness, as well as those of us who are policymakers, not us, but those who are policymakers and decision makers and those who exercise influence, uh, really have to, uh, what I have what I call an ethical responsibility, uh, not only to speak about what your particular interests are, but also what obtains generally. If a country like Barbados could in 2010 have four convictions and you worried about convictions, you can say, why not us? If a country like Malawi, with more than 80% of the population, probably, I think, I, I can't remember the exact figure, uh, way below what we would consider our poverty line, then why not us? Right? I think if we get the big picture in that sense, and uh, we get more of the right type of information, and it's handled responsibly and ethically, we may not have been uh, you know, in the position we're in today. And I say we because I believe it's a collective responsibility. It's one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. Because, um, the rest I can tell you as well. Um, I initially took a position that I, I really didn't want to get involved in anything because there's so much political color to what's happening there and it's very difficult to distill. Uh, but I decided to take it out of the, take the opportunity to speak to you guys, out of the need um, you know, to do exactly what you said, which is to, to help, I guess, uh, inform 
and educate and try to do so in as sort of neutral way as possible and to expand the possibilities of your mind as well in terms of how you think about the MLCFT compliance and how you think about where Guyana will be and what Guyana can avoid it. I'm glad I didn't cover that agenda because truthfully I don't have any. Uh, because I think it allowed me to fully express confidently so and fearlessly so uh, how I think we can look at that big picture. So I'm encouraged. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dave Martins. Uh, my question is probably addressed to Mr. Hines rather than you. But more simply, thank you so much. More simply. <laughs> my question is following the comment from Anna about elucidation. Is is this? Uh, I don't know if this event has been recorded, but if it hasn't been recorded, I hope, I hope not. Okay. Well, I hope it was, but because my that's where my point. Because my question is. What are the possibilities of an assembly other than this one of the political people who are currently wrangling over pass or don't pass? What are the possibilities of them getting this elucidation that we have received tonight? Well, um, there are none here this evening, which is uh, instructive. Um, we can only ask, we can only invite. Um, the chamber has no difficulty in. Um, in, in looking at the coordinate in that kind of gathering. A lot of it depends on the response. Uh, but certainly that is something that we can do. And certainly we will sit down um, certainly at, at the chamber and see whether there's something that, that, that is possible. But yes, we will need to do it, but again, it depends on their acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Boyce. I have maybe three simple questions. Has there been a study on the effect of what happens to the exchange rate, and then the second part, the interest rate, and the third part, what countermeasures have been taken against any countries that have been blacklisted, and even more so any that have been blacklisted at our size relative to like similar statistics? I want to, but I get of answering your first question, if I could just go back and make that to that slide. There's a slide I, sorry. I'll try to do this very quickly. There's a slide that I, that I went by rather quickly that had to do with, but I can find it though. Um, that had to do with, um, oh, let's let me go back, I think. Remember the slide that, that, uh, that had the consequences? Bear with me, please. Uh, the answer essentially to the question is yes. Um, I do have a slide on the, there's another way I can find it, sorry. But the answer to the first question is yes. Um, there have been multiple studies done on the issue of impacts. I really think I should find that slide, I'm sorry, because I think it, it really would help to, uh, to clarify what is the extent of that. I look for it. While, while I address the other, the other issues. Um, on all manner of, um, all manner of things, impacts, you know, there have been impacts. Um, in terms of size, I think Guyana is unique because, because I, I, I'm sure you don't mean geographic size, you probably mean GDP or some other, some other measure. Uh, the answer would be yes, because countries of all sizes have been, have been touched. When you think about blacklisting, those who know the most think in the most serious way, principally about North Korea and Iran. Of course, there are other elements of that list that, um, there are other elements of that list that we can, we can sort of pay attention to, but you, know, you tend to gravitate towards those. But there are a number of other countries as well. And there are countries that have no reason being on any FATF list that are currently suffering the, the ignominy and embarrassment of having uh, to be there. Uh, for instance, Turkey. Turkey right now is having a problem with its, with its uh, well, not a, I shouldn't say that. There's some consideration as to whether Turkey is suffering exactly from that, implications on its um, exchange rate. But I think those may have to do um, with other circumstances. I promise you I'll find that slide and I'll put it up, right? With other circumstances outside of, um, 
outside of its borders, you know, from the U.S. influences and so on. There may be some peculiar situations with YAN that may affect, that may drive that. Those are not, something like exchange rates is not, is not always um, driven by a single factor. So um, I guess it's yes, but I don't have enough information to tell you, to point you specifically to a country, but, but yeah. All right, uh, as we look at the, um, the slide and some of the consequences of, uh, of the bailing measures, I'll ask uh, to some to tell us um, when or if FATF recommends their countervailing measures uh, or recommend to their members to apply countervailing measures against Guyana. Um, to tell us what happens after that and how long would these uh, adverse uh, statements be applied to Guyana and how do we retract it, get FATF to retract it? It's a process of listing and delisting, and in the event that that happens, now, I have two problems. The first is that it's very difficult to speculate because it really depends on how we respond. Uh, for instance, one of the things I wanted to cover tonight but I didn't is, is to what extent can we achieve as a country what's called a high-level political commitment to address our MLCFT deficiencies. That's one example of something that will have to be overcome. Uh, first to get out that, to be delisted uh, quickly. So the first is that I, I really can't speculate. And, um, and the other is that it's really driven, it's going to be more driven by, um, I wouldn't even want to say a political process, as much as it is really uh, a collective process of the country itself. Some countries have managed to zip on and off lists relatively quickly, not only FATF. If you look at the example of, um, of uh, Look at these countries like Belize. Um, Belize had a problem with their draftsmen, you know, being able to draft the law. They were listed by CFPTF. They managed to get the law passed. They were off. When Juris, I think, managed to get out of in a relatively short space of time, that uh, I stand corrected. Antigua spent a little bit longer than they needed to. Other countries have struggled to get off of any list whatsoever for the longest while, like Turkey. Uh, so it, it really all depends on those two factors as one of many. Um, and, but the most important thing I want to mention, uh, two things rather. One is that, I should have mentioned earlier, there may be some questions I wouldn't be able to answer. Not because I don't know, but I don't think it's convenient to. But the second thing is that this goes to your question, is that um, based on what I said tonight, the two important things you should leave here remembering is that Technical compliance is half the story. The other half of the story in the future is going to be effectiveness assessments. How capable are we of either achieving an effective uh, regime, or if listed, being able to achieve an effective regime in the process uh, prior to or during our next um, mutual evaluation, whether that comes in 2010 or 2010, 2020, sorry, or 2021 or 2019. That's going to be important that we don't do this three. You know, climb the hill that I showed you and then fall right back down. So those are the considerations I would say. For the sake of argument, let us assume we became technically compliant tomorrow. That is, we passed the legislation. What would be the key elements for us to become yeah. uh, and that's a good question. So we get over what I mentioned, this phase of achieving technical compliance. Uh, we pass the legislation. We do. We, we don't have to do all, and we go through the ICRG process at CFATF level, and we're off the list. All of the key pillars that I mentioned. Um, have to be displayed in some way or other, to different degrees. And I could probably put the list back up again, that, that, that chart. Those immediate outcomes that drive the three intermediate outcomes 
that, dry, that drives that high level outcome of protection of the financial system is going to have to be achieved to achieve effectiveness. But that is in the future. We have some time with that because we have until CFPTF is ready to do its uh, mutual evaluation. That was part of the national risk assessment. But in fact, that process will be influenced by how we deal with the current ICRG process, the referral to FATF. So that may influence it. I don't know how, whether I'll push it back, I don't know how, I don't want to speculate. But the point is that um, all of the pillars that I mentioned, the key FATF pillars in the new methodology, will have to demonstrate some level of, of achievement of those outcomes. And in addition, there's some of the other pillars that I mentioned, including things like, uh, you know, my dealt with corruption and so on, among those other things that I felt are important. A movement on those things are also important because it's going to help uh, to demonstrate that even though we can have a bespoke system, what I mentioned earlier, even though it may be not very compliant, it can also be effective, right? So even if there is a perceived weakness in one area, at least we have to be effective. That is, that is what is being required of us going forward. So I imagine that um, those will be the key considerations, which is compliance in the short term, more maybe the next few years, and then the ability to achieve both technical compliance and effectiveness in the long, medium to longer term in a way that satisfies, even if we have a very bespoke regime, I'm big on bespoke regimes, I'm big on tailored solutions to tailored pro to problems, I'm big on, personally that is, I'm big on crafting, um, regimes that are appropriate for your risks and resources. I'm not trying to be a copycat. I give the Malawi example, but I never said that we should do what Malawi did. But I give the Malawi example just to broaden our minds. There are many other countries, Nigeria and so on, and other countries even closer to home. Not many people remember that countries like uh, the Bahamas and so on were all blacklisted back in 2000, 2002, between that period. They managed to make it up. So they're really good models close to home that we can look at. And uh, look at for ideas and look at for examples of what is possible. And the reason why we should do that is so that we're not daunted. We don't become prisoners to our own paralysis of thinking that there is no way out. I like to see the glasses as more half full, but that's just my own personal perspective. But I try not to let too much of it come out during the talk. I try to be very neutral. So if I were to anticipate Another question behind your question as to whether or not I think it's possible, if I'm allowed to do that, I would say mightily so. I would say that I believe, and again this is probably my conceit, that uh, Guyana has what it takes. And I can look optimistically uh, and say that I hope that, that at the time of our next MER, whenever that is, we'll be not only uh, able to demonstrate uh, technical, technical compliance, uh, but uh, the most be so as well, uh, 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 effectiveness. In a best case scenario, if you're well known to those with whom you deal, or sufficiently well known for them to understand your risks, or the risks that you are likely to generate to them, or contaminate them with, uh, that they may not wish to take any countermeasures against you. When I spoke to the lawyers last year, I was able to give them a concrete example. Using a transaction for purchase of a business between a Trinidad company and a company in Miami. And I was able to give them a specific, very granular example. I can't do that now. Because in that case, I was speaking to lawyers and I was talking specifically to what their role is. And I was able to show them what type of countermeasures would apply from the Trinidad perspective and how they would apply. I can't do that now because your business may be manufacturing and someone else may be into foreign exchange and so on. And it'd be very difficult for that person to, to learn specifically from that. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is engagement is important. If you think it's sufficient for you to just wait to see what will happen, then bravo. Your mere appearance or attendance here is a sign that you're concerned, that you're interested, at least in learning what's likely to happen or what's happening. And that engagement, I'm not saying go hold up a card somewhere. I'm saying that engagement, you yourself, what a concern, or your own personal concern, your own financial concern, 
it matters. Because it takes a multitude to effect the kind of change that we'll get, that, that Gadi will need. It will, take a, it will take a multitude, or as I say, a village. And the fourth, the third thing I would say, sorry, is that the way in which we, and I'll end on this uh, probably, 